Good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you might be. My name is Claude Granitsky, and I'm a native son of Togo, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you as the moderator for this United Nations. Today's topic, as you probably already know if you're here, is Africa's youth in the decade of action. And I really want to insist on the word action because we're defining action as in Will Africa's youth be actors or bystanders? And that is the topic of today's program. You're here with us for a little bit more than an hour. And I would like to share my great pleasure in welcoming the person who made it all happen and who will give us the welcome remarks. And that is Dr. Vera Songwe. Dr. Vera Songwe is a very well-known Cameroonian economist. Um, she's uh, had a, a storied career at the World Bank and other institutions. She's currently the Under Secretary General of the United Nations, as well as the Executive Secretary of the Economic Commission for Africa, our host for today. So Dr. Vera Songwe, welcome. We know you have a really busy schedule and we would just love to hear from you because Africa's youth needs encouragement. Doc Dr. Songwe, you're on mute. Thank you, no, thank you so much. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Wonderful, wonderful. Greetings from Addis Ababa. Um, thank you for uh, uh, doing this for us, Claude. Uh, and uh, welcome to, to, to this larger community of Africa's youth. Um, Deputy Minister of Information from Namibia, uh, Minister Teofilis Emma, um, the founder of the Africa I Know, uh, Assistant Professor uh, Aji Bosong Dieng. Um, the managing director of Lion Tutoring, Tobo Kathlo Ka Kath Christian Leke. Um, good to have you, executive director, of course, of Loyok. Um, it is really, really a pleasure. It's been a long time. Um, many people have put in a lot of effort to bring us uh, together as Africa's youth. I've been waiting and looking for, forward to this opportunity. Let me start by thanking everybody who worked to do this at the ECA. Um, you know, we, we at the, the, the UN are really trying to see how we can reinvigorate the SDG agenda to make sure that, you know, we don't get, uh, lose touch of it despite COVID, despite all the difficulties that we're having on the continent. Our, our Secretary General has put forward a new agenda or a, a, an agenda to accelerate that process called um, the, the, the common agenda, which essentially says, you know, let's look at where we are and let's see how we can go forward. But there is no way we can go forward on this continent if we are not working with our youth. Africa's youth between now and uh, 20, uh, 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 the next uh, 50 to 70 years is going to be about, you know, almost 90% of our population. We know that Asia is shrinking. We know that Europe uh, uh, is aging or Asia is aging, Europe is aging. Latin America has already passed its demographic dividend. So we are with South, Southeast Asia, the two continents that still have you know, the potential for a demographic dividend that can really benefit the continent. But even on our continent, we have, you know, we know the southern part of our continent and the northernmost part of our continent have probably already gone past their demographic dividend. So it's this middle belt, right, that really still holds the potential for the continent. And we hope that, you know, we can really find in this community one, a community that supports each other, a community that talks about what are the opportunities out there, a community that helps us to redefine the continent in a way that is uniquely ours, in a way that says, you know, this is how we the youth want to define prosperity for Africa. This is how we the youth want to do better governance. This is how we the youth 
want to do better innovation and how we can take advantages of everything that we've seen during this COVID crisis. Despite the fact that it's been a terrible crisis, we know that we've seen huge opportunity with innovations on the ICT side. We've seen people begin to visit more Africa because we can go out to further field places in Europe and other places. So tourism on our continent is growing. We're seeing better and different kinds of tourism. It's not beach tourism, it's green, more sustainable tourism that we're being able to experience. And I think all this is beginning to show Africa that within ourselves, we have the potential to grow at the eight, nine, 10% that we need to create the 16 million jobs for you, the youth. But for us to create those jobs, you have to decide that you want to come in to our formal economies. You have to decide that you want to become creative parts of our society, not just consuming the ICT sector, but actually developing, becoming designers, becoming app creators. At the Economic Commission for Africa, we launched a program called Girls Can Code. The Girls Can Code program is a fantastic program which is linking girls across the continent, teaching them the internet of things, artificial intelligence, uh, uh, gaming uh, uh, through the internet. It is a job creating program. For the future, African youth has to create its own jobs. African youth has to become the employer, the entrepreneur of the continent and why not of the world. And I think those kinds of innovations are the things we are waiting to see and we are looking for from African youth. The digital technology potential is endless. It's a $47 trillion economy. If we were going to begin to exploit it on our continent, with a $2.5 trillion uh, GDP today, Africa's you know, opportunities in this digital space is enormous. COP26, climate change, sustainability, another huge sector where we believe that the youth can become quite influential in terms of changing our habits, changing our patterns. The good thing about Africa is that we haven't yet invested in technology that we need to sort of discard of. We're still in a very new space. We don't yet have enough energy. Half of our continent doesn't have energy. So we can do renewable energy. We can continue to do some gas. We can begin to manufacture on our continent because of the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. We can do more value addition across different sectors of the economy. We're talking about cobalt. We're talking about you know uh, fashion and design, how we can use our cotton to create textiles, to create better uh, 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 outfits that are continental and are demanded worldwide. We're talking about our music, of course, our art. We've seen you know, from Europe, our art coming back to the continent, but we can begin to create ours. You can be the literary geniuses of, of the future. I think I'm giving out all these examples just to show the potential of Africa's youth today, to show what we expect from Africa's youth. We at the United Nations, I think, are working to see how we can create the policy space for governments to allow for the private sector, to allow for you, young entrepreneurs, we're working on innovation to see how we can secure your innovation, how we can make uh, intellectual property registration cheaper so that when you innovate, you can actually keep your innovation, you can actually get resources out of that innovation. We don't have as many unicorns on the continent today because the policy space is not yet as conducive as we would like it to be. We hope that as we go forward into the future, we can actually create a policy space that allows you to actually excel in the private sector when you do the businesses, when you decide to become entrepreneurs. But we also know that to become an entrepreneur, you cannot do it alone. You must do it as a community. And this is why the Economic Commission for Africa is having this dialogue to say, let's come together. Let's see what we can do together. The Futures uh, Lab initiative that we are launching, the SG wants to create a transforming education summit in 2022. We at the Economic Commission for Africa have just launched a Young Economist Network. All this to see how we can bring the youth more together, how we can make sure that we talk across each, uh, our countries to bring the continent together in a way that actually delivers, first for you, but delivers for the continent. Because if our continent today delivers for you, if our continent creates jobs for you, then it will happen for the whole continent. It will create a more, more peaceful, uh, we see our continent today as one which is conflict ridden in many places because we believe the economics is not adding up. And I think that if you take charge of that economics, if you take charge of creating more businesses, of joining the public sector in a more transparent, public service driven way, that some of those tensions that we see in our societies today would lessen and Africa's growth trajectory will accelerate to a place where we can actually have a prosperous Africa by 2030. So I'm hoping that with these conversations that we are having today, we are able to begin to create a new community that you know, works towards climate change, that works to digitize our economy better, that works to create jobs, that works for women and equality so that we can use all the talents that we have on the continent to ensure that we get to a place where everybody's 
GDP per capita is something that allows them to live in a more uh, with more prosperity and in a safer, healthier environment, of course, as we talk about COVID and how we get out of it. So once again, thank you so much uh, um, for joining this conversation today. And I hope that uh, we, this is just the beginning of a conversation that we will continue throughout the next eight, nine years as we try to get to Agenda 2030 and see how Africa's youth can ensure that we actually make it there and make it successfully. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Vera Songwei. I really love how you spoke about conversation, community, creating jobs, which will lead to economic prosperity and, 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 and economic development uh, for the whole continent. The fact that you're really focusing on youth and inclusive youth by also looking at, at women and the role young women can play in helping to grow Africa, that is really very encouraging for us. Um, I now want to move to our keynote speaker, and our keynote speaker has been in the news a lot recently, uh, specifically leading up to the UN Climate Change Conference, COP26. And I wanna introduce with great pleasure, um, Ms. Elizabeth Wanjiru Watuti, who is one of Africa's best known climate and environmental activists. Welcome, uh, Ms. Uh, Wanjiru Watuti. Thank you so much. My name is Elizabeth Watuti and I'm an environmentalist and a climate activist from Kenya. And I'm also the founder of Green Generation Initiative and the head of campaigns at Wangari Maathai Foundation. And thank you for the opportunity to address this forum. And I would like to begin with a short story on what inspired me to become an environmentalist or rather an environmental advocate. And begin by saying that children care in the purest and sweetest way for the natural world from the birds, flowers, bees and butterflies and the trees that they see every day. And for me as a child, I spent most of my time chasing the butterflies and playing close to clean streams with the trees that were ahead of me and bushes beside me. And this was in the most forested region in Kenya, in Nyeri County, which is my birthplace and also the birthplace to the late Nobel laureate Professor Ngari Mathai. Her passion, love and dedication to environmental conservation has continued to greatly inspire me up to date. I started growing trees at the tender age of seven and during this time, Professor Ngai Mathai was the member of parliament in my home region. Along the way, I have also faced ecological grief witnessing environmental destruction. At some point in my early adulthood, I remember paying a visit to a hill that used to be my favorite when I was still a child. I was so excited, but when I got there, I felt angry and heartbroken witnessing how most of the huge trees had been turned into logs and stumps. There were no more and I couldn't understand why anyone would destroy such a beautiful forest. But then I knew that all was not last. So I learned the art of turning my reactions into action and also my anger into a hunger to want to do something to address challenges like deforestation and the climate crisis. And so as a young person and a climate activist, I have not been sitting back and feeling helpless. I am not only influencing how governments and big corporations or businesses and other people respond to the climate crisis, but I am also driving positive change by working with others to protect and regenerate those places where nature touches us close to home. As the founder of the Green Generation Initiative, I have been doing what I can. I founded the initiative uh, to be able to create a generation of environmentally conscious individuals and through this initiative, we are nurturing young people to love nature and be environmentally conscious through ground nature-based solutions that also address food insecurity through food forest establishment. We are also running a tree growing campaign that enhances food security for young Kenyans. And so far we've grown over 30,000 fruit trees to maturity, providing the desperately needed nutrition to thousands of children. And every day we see that when we look after the trees, they look after us. And this is at a time when climate change challenges such as food insecurity have greatly impacted my country. And right now over 2.1 million Kenyans are facing climate related starvation. And I would say that this has not been achieved without challenges. And I know that many other young people share the same frustrations. One of the main challenges has been accessing serious funding to scale up the initiative. 
as you know, it's never easy to scale up and maximize on the impact being made through youth-led solutions without proper funding or from one small pot of funding to the next. But even more importantly, when the political and economic system in Kenya and internationally is working against you, it's always difficult to be able to continue making an impact. And a very practical example is when one on one side of the school gates, the children that we work with are planting trees, but on the other, they see developers cutting down primary forests. And beyond Kenya's borders, countries are continuing to burn fossil fuels and degrade ecosystems, which will make Kenya's climate uninhabitable for these same children and the trees that they are planting. This is the case for so many young Africans. And I know many other inspiring young African activists who are also doing remarkable work on the ground beyond influencing the world to also take immediate action. And I just want to name but a few, uh, like Vanessa Nakata who is installing solar systems in schools and institutional stores in Uganda. We also have a young lady called Ramina Pollard from Kenya, who is making biodegradable bags and products from the water hyacinth in Lake Victoria. Adeni Keoladosu is running community education forums in Nigeria while protecting Lake Chad. And there's also Remy Zahiga, who is working to protect the world's second largest rainforest, the Congo rainforest. And that's just to name but a few. There are so many others doing remarkable work. And I do appreciate all of you, including those that I have not mentioned. We see you, we hear you, and we will together continue fighting. But it is challenging when decisions being made by their political leaders or decisions being made elsewhere are undermining these efforts of young people. I'd like to thank UNECA for hosting this event with young people. It is important to recognize the positive role that young people are playing already. I also recognize the UN's push to elevate young people more widely, including a recent invite by the, the UN Secretary General for us to meet him at COP26 alongside fellow young climate activists like Vanessa Nakate, Eric Njoguna, Mitzi, Nicole Becker, and Greta Thunberg. Most of us share in the same mm -hmm. frustration of not really feeling hard. So we need to do so much more to achieve proper representation of African youth. For example, looking back at COP26, some young people, including myself, were given a platform to speak. But we still see that the interests and voices of young people are not present in the rooms where the real decisions are being made. So we have a very serious issue of intergenerational inequity. By definition, all of the levels of power are held by people above a certain age, and it's mostly over 40 or 50 years old, because these are the people who are believed to have been in the workforce the longest. But the greatest consequences of their decisions today will be borne by young people and those who are yet to be born, and in particular those in Africa. And there's nothing that's forcing older people to take younger people's interest into account. So for me, youth engagement doesn't mean inviting young people onto panels. Serious youth engagement means internalizing the fact that young people and future generations have got the biggest stake in the decisions that are being made today and then centering their voices and interest in decision-making. Every time a decision is being made, leaders must ask themselves, will this decision be good for today's children and those yet to be born? And children and young people must be in the room to share their own views on that question. Right now, I don't have direct experience of working with the UNECA, so I will not say what they could do better in terms of this engagement, this is a question that all big institutions, including UNECA and the UN more widely, need to ask themselves in a deep way. But I have some questions for UN employees and also decision makers in the audience to consider. And the first question is for the decision makers in the audience. Are the policy decisions you're making in your countries really in the interest of young people and children? Are you centering their voices and interests whenever you make a decision? And my second question is to UNECA or the UN employees as well. Are you doing all you can to ensure that the decision makers you interact with are taking decisions that are in the interests of young people and the children? And could you go further? I'll just conclude by saying that every day I'm inspired by young people who are refusing to be victims and who are every day working tirelessly to deliver solutions and to advocate for a livable world. I always see a whole generation 
of humans who are pouring their energy and all their creativity into regenerating a dying world. I also strongly recognize the efforts of all the young Africans in the audience, and I encourage you to keep going because we can do this. It is time for governments and organizations to get behind our generation and to take our interests seriously and also pour our resources into scaling up the great work that young people are doing. Let's move beyond tokenism into serious collaboration. And that's the way that we are going to make sure that we are supporting young people and together we are going to put people and our planet above profits and make the right decisions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elizabeth Watuti, for your inspiring words. I really was inspired, particularly by the, world, the word collaboration that you used and the fact that you mentioned some of your fellow activists uh, from the African continent. You mentioned Vanessa Nakate, you mentioned Adenike Oladosu. What I find is that when I mention these fearless activists that you're a part of, um, a new generation that is really helping to change the game with respect to awareness around the environmental issues across Africa, people outside of Africa are more aware of, of, of these names than people inside our own continent. Uh, Vanessa Nakate was on the cover of Time magazine, and I was speaking to some people in Togo and Benin um, recently, they didn't, never heard of her. And it's interesting that we can shine a light on the work that you're doing, because you're speaking with passion, you're speaking with conviction. And more importantly, the way that you spoke about the role of the United Nations and the role of power in government means that you're really speaking truth to power, which I find really interesting because when I was growing up as um, a boy in Togo, we were not allowed to speak up. You know, it, only adults could speak. And, and, and now I find that, you, you, again, your fearlessness is really uh, driving the conversation and bringing many, many different stakeholders to, uh, to the table. So again, thank you very much for your words of wisdom. And we look forward to continuing the conversation for a very long time until actual solutions can be found and, 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 and actually um, uh, change can come to the African continent. I actually produced a documentary, an award-winning documentary called The Great Green Wall, which is about um, a wall of trees, an 8,000 kilometer wall of trees that is being um, actually uh, planted from um, along the Sahel from Senegal all the way to Djibouti in the east. And again, I find that many Africans have never heard of this project, which is one of the major projects of the um, African Union in, 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 um, in partnership with uh, many different states and also the uh, United Nations. So again, thank you for raising uh, the bar on our conversation, which really sets the tone for the panel that we are about to embark on. And it's really about the sustainable development goals. So a lot of people talk about the SDGs, but many people don't actually know what these SDGs means. So these sustainable development goals, all 17 of them um, are, are very much um, you know, fodder for conversation in conferences such as this one, but we're gonna look to unpack what this means for Africa and for African youth. And I just wanna maybe start with a simple definition before I welcome our panel. And if we're gonna just really simplify it to its core, the sustainable development goals are a call for action by all countries, poor countries, rich countries, middle income countries. And the goal is to promote prosperity while protecting the planet. So again, what you said, Elizabeth Watuti, about the, the central role of people in protecting the planet is something that I believe that many Africans, young Africans and older Africans also need to take into consideration. So with that as the background for our panel, I would like to welcome my panelists who will be discussing the theme, Africa's youth in the decade of action, actors or bystanders. Again, my name is Claude Grunitsky. I am an entrepreneur from Togo. I was born in Togo and I've been a media entrepreneur. I created several media companies, Trace, True Africa. And right now I'm working with MIT to launch True Africa University, which is an online learning platform that is all about the sustainable development goals. And it's my, 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 my honor to uh, welcome my four panelists today. And we will start with ladies first, obviously. And my first panelist is um, the Honorable Enma Theophilus, who is the Deputy Minister of Information, Communications and Technology of the Republic of Namibia. So I will ask each panelist to introduce him or herself in one minute or less. 
and then we're going to get into our discussion. Um, Dr. Um, Vera Sangue is still here. Thank you for listening in. We know you have a busy schedule. So I now will ask the Honorable Emma Teofilis to introduce herself. Welcome. Thank you so much, Cloud. A very good afternoon uh, from Bintuk Namibia to all the panelists and all the listeners who are listening to this very important um, discussion today. I'd like to give a great shout out to Elizabeth for such a powerful speech and a call to action uh, for all of us in all our spaces and all our spheres um, towards um, the agenda for young people across the world, uh, in Africa in particular, as well as to really accelerate our efforts in achieving the sustainable development goals. Uh, as introduced, my name is Emma Teofilis. I am a member of parliament and deputy minister of information, communication technology in the Republic of Namibia. Uh, prior to my role, I was a law student um, at the University of Namibia. And before that, I was very much policy adjacent in issues around human rights. Uh, co-founded a few organizations related to uh, sexual reproductive health and rights and um, the potential of young people being actors and, and participants in decision-making processes in our democracies. And I'm very happy to be here and to in indulge in this conversation. Thank you very much. Oh, welcome. Thank you so much, um, um, Emma Theophilus. It was um, it's great to have such a, uh, um, a a major leader in our in our and a decision maker in our on our panel. So with that, I also want to welcome uh, Professor Aji Busodiang, who is the founder of the Africa I Know and an assistant professor at Princeton University in New Jersey. Hi, Claude. Thank you for for the introduction. I would like to. Thank you, Neka, for inviting me to participate in this important discussion. And I also thank everyone involved in the organization. Um, I, I, um, I'm looking forward to digging deeper into the issues we'll be discussing. Um, I'm originally from Senegal, uh, where I grew up, and um, I've had my education, my entire education in, in STEM, and I hope to make the case for that uh, when it comes to realizing the SDGs in Africa. Uh, I'm the founder of an organization, a nonprofit organization called the Africa I Know, whose mission is to change the narrative about Africa by leveraging the power of media and education, especially STEM education. Um, uh, we, we have been developing programs targeted towards uh, kids in impoverished areas and also, um, and also students from primary up to university. And we hope that you'll see these programs soon. Um, we managed to send 1,100 kids from impoverished areas in Senegal to school for the first time this year, and we hope to expand that program. And the reason why we're um, we are um, investing in STEM education is, I think, is because I think it's it will be the main driver to Africa's industrialization by 2030. And I, I hope to dig deeper into that. So thanks, everyone. Thank you. Next up on the panel is Mr. Tobo Katola, who is the managing director of Lion Tutoring, and you will also tell us what Lion Tutoring actually is. Welcome. Hey, uh, thanks so much, uh, Mr. Grunitsky. Um, yes, my name is Tobo Katola. Um, I'm from Botswana, and normally from Botswana, we say Dumelang, that is a way of saying hi to everyone. Um, and we normally like to say protocol has been observed. Um, so thank you so much um, for our organizer, you know, Ineka, for having us here. And yes, um, I'm based here in Botswana, but we are running a company called Lion Tutoring, um, which is basically a tutoring service provider. And so far, we have penetrated our local market. We are also based in South Africa, Johannesburg. And next year, we'll be getting into the Nairobian uh, market there in, in Kenya. So basically the company, uh, we operate an Uber for tutors. So wherever you are in the world, if you want a tutor, you just download our mobile app and it will show you the tutors based in your location. And um, you would pay on the app and then we'll send the tutor to your house. So that's basically um, what the app does. So I like that we mentioned the sustainable development goals and you know, I'm actually more inclined to the quality education. You know, we, we want to see an African continent with, you know, good quality education, 
would like to see an African continent with you know low unemployment because I think uh, for all of our countries we have a very high unemployment problem. And here in Botswana, we hire close to 300 young people. We made it onto the Forbes 30 under 30 list um, of 2020. And we just hope to make a difference in our continent, um, starting from our own small country of Botswana and neighboring countries and all the way into the world. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tobo. I think it would be great if um, we're not trying to be modest on this call. So if you could tell us that what the cover of Forbes Africa that is behind you, what is that? Because that is your background. And I think this audience needs to know what is behind you. Oh, thanks, Lord. Thanks, Lord. Yeah. Yes, um, so that is the Forbes 30 under 30. We, we made it also on the cover, and um, that was 2020. And it has really been a great opportunity not to just serve my country, but to serve the whole African continent. I was in Dr. Dieng's uh, neighborhood a few months ago for the AFCFTA uh, um, in Senegal. So I'm really humbled to serve our whole entire continent. Well, thank you and congratulations. Our final panelist is Mr. Achaleke Christian Leke, um, is the executive director of Loyo Cameroon. And so we would love to hear about Loyo Cameroon and hear about your own background, Mr. Achaleke Christian Leke. Um, th thank you very much, uh, Claude. It's, it's a pleasure to join this conversation. And uh, my name is Christian Achaleke, and I'm based in Cameroon, uh, born and bred. And my core interest is around uh, peace building. And so SDG 16 has been uh, part of my mandate and our approach is building peace from looking at different disciplines. So we have work around, you know, employability, we have work around education and others. And I, I grew up in a very uh, violent community and lived on hand violence. So it actually inspired and influenced my vision to ensure that young people do not engage in violence and see how we could be violent-free communities. And growing in a country like Cameroon that, you know, we've metamorphosed into active conflict from both ends. You know, my mandate has been, you know, strengthened and it's been part of the work. Um, Local Youth Corner Cameroon is a youth-led organization. Um, I started there as a volunteer 15 years ago, and today I serve as an executive director. So I've been able to serve and build my capacity. And today we are a youth-led organization working around policy, practice, and also working around advocacy and research as young people, because we came to understand that young people are always seen as troublemakers. So for us to change the dynamics or the narrative, we had to show evidence. So based on the evidence, I had the opportunity um, to be part of the process of developing the UN Security Council resolutions on youth peace and security from you know, New York right to local community. But at the same time, we are doing practical work around what we call prisonpreneurship. It's one of our leading programs where we are building entrepreneurs from prison and working with former violent and violent extremist offenders. We also have a, an education program for victims of Boko Haram children, where we created a free school for this kind of children. And my mandate has been able to extend, most recently serving the African Union as one of the African Union's youth ambassador uh, for the Af sub Central African subregion. And basically this is the work that we've been able to do. And it has been able to pick some traction um, from 2016. 2016, I was recognized uh, by the Commonwealth and uh, by Her Majesty the Queen of England as the Commonwealth Young Person of the Year. And since then, it has been a glorious time, but opportunities to work and, you know, do the kind of initiatives which, you know, speaks of how young people can change narratives of how young people can build communities and peace and provide the kind of services which the world needs with little or no support. So it is, it's against this background of, you know, violence, conflict and understanding the dynamics of violence and using that not to make me feel bad, but using it as an opportunity to build. And that has been uh, uh, the experience uh, uh, so far. Thank you very much. And I'm sure I'm going to share a lot uh, during our conversations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Achaleke. You will share a lot. And again, I just wanted to start by saying this panel is, 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 is really a lot of distinguished people. Everybody here is an overachiever. But this panel is not about us and our achievements. You know, everybody here is about action. Everybody here is about doer. But, you know, what I'm really interested in is what we, I would call the change forces for Africa. You know, what I consider to be a good outcome of this conversation 
is if we can just come with one or two actionable initiatives that could really be, lead to lasting change all over the continent. So I will start with you, Achaleke, again. And if I'm going to ask you in the work that you do and what you have seen all over the continent, what would be one major change force that you would consider to be worthy of this discussion that we're having today? I, I think um, one of the key things and, and, and Vera highlighted about it, it's about you know, entrepreneurship, it's around employability. Um, it's very important job creation uh, because from my experience, uh, one of the push factors in every conflict zones I've worked in across the continent and the world is around uh, um, young people and communities having issues of poverty, education, lack of education, and all of that. And from my experience, while working in the Far North region, where we currently have Boko Haram, when we launched the initiative called the Salam School, uh, as a group of young people, education in this region is something which is very far first, not talk of children or young girls. And when we saw this as a group of young people, uh, we said we want to start a school. And people asked us, Christian, you want to start a school, you don't have money. How do you want to get it done? You know, I, I, I told the community, it's not about having money. It's about wanting to solve the problem. And when we started the Salam initiative with just few kids who uh, most of them suffer from radicalization and recruitment and even use as suicide bumpers in cases that we saw. And before we could know it, you know, the, the schools there from one to two, we have 150 of these children today. We have no classrooms, you know, but we started under the sun. And before we knew, we started using, you know, plastic tent. And the plastic tent was so hot, then the community helped us to build a grass herd, you know, and these children were studying. I just want to give you something which happened, which was different. In our first months of this program, when we asked these children, whom do you want to become? They all wanted to become military. Why? Because they were filled with the, the zeal to revenge or avenge because they saw Boko Haram kill their parents and imagine a child at the age of five, six, seven, and all you have is to pay back. Where are you leading to? And when we worked with them and eight months later, you know, that was late 2020. And when we spoke to these kids and it was like, what do you want to become? And we started hearing them say, you want to become lawyers, doctors, teachers. I think that education also gives hope and sets a pace, you know, for where you want to go to. It's a big risk for us because it's a conflict zone as young people. But I feel that this gave me an opportunity to see that as young Africans, we can do things differently. And statistics has proven that over 60% of organizations working as young people for peace operate under 10,000 US dollar. Now, the amount of work we do for peace by looking at key drivers like education, employability, makes us understand that with or without resources, young Africans are serving their continent and are willing to respond to the things that pushes people to war. Now, some of our partners, you might not understand what it means to be in an active conflict zone, or if you've never been promised that you'll be kidnapped or been told before the price for your ransom. It is worrying, it is traumatizing, but it should not make you run away or scared, but it should make you realize that you must respond to the root causes. And these things, employability, education, Poverty are key things that we have to respond to. And when, when Vera was talking, I really felt touched because I have seen it live, not policy, not at UN level, but in a community where people thought young people are the most stubborn, they can only carry arms, but we've been able to change the dynamics. And this is three years down the line. We have a school started by young people, little or no funding. We have all the big agencies there, but sometimes it's around funding dynamics and funding lines. But we are suffering. We don't care. Boko Haram has killed over 100,000 people. Should we let this continue or respond to? So, I mean, this is practically how and something which I have been part of, which I feel aligns with, you know, some of the global conversations that we are having. And from practice and evidence, I feel that working to promote education, provide education, to those who are even more vulnerable to conflict and violence is the best thing that can happen, you know, to a group of people. Claude. I mean, these are just some thoughts I, I wanted to share. Well, these are important thoughts because it starts with your own experience, peace building. It starts with witnessing what's happening in active conflict zones and, and, it, and it leads to education, which is what I would call the big change force 
that I'm, is coming out of what you just said right now. What do you want to become? These are very powerful statements. And then you also said young Africans can do things differently. This is really what I'd like to focus on in my transition to Emma Teofilos and the conversation around what she's been doing at the government level in Namibia. You know, some people forget, and I always say this, that there's more children born in Nigeria alone than in the entire European Union, even if you include the UK, which has now left the European Union. So this is huge growth, right? 60% of the population is under the age of 25. Yet, if you look at the world's poor, the whole entire world, the poor people, half of them are still in the African continent. So you have big responsibility as government officials and as policymakers, as members of parliament, um, Emma Teofilis, how are you harnessing the power of technology <laughs> to provide education, employment um, uh, solutions for young Africans and actually starting with your own country, um, uh, Namibia? Thank you so much, Claude. I think I, I first want to speak about two change forces, I think, uh, would move the continent in terms of uh, actually realizing the SDGs. One, um, on this African continent, we need to increase the ability for young Africans to have access to the global digital economy. This means making uh, mobile phones more accessible, making data more affordable, and then allowing that ripple effect uh, to reclaim back and innovate our collective African creati creativity industry. I think there is so many gains we are losing as young people who are born in the time of technology, who understand how technology works, who appreciate its, its, its valuability, and we're not necessarily harnessing um, that benefit now. Then the second one would be young people in positions of decision making. I don't know if you know this, Claude, but I was appointed last year as a member of parliament and a deputy minister at the age of 23. So amongst all members of parliament and, and people in the executive, I'm the youngest by far on the continent. And this is a new space and a new realization that young people being majority uh, in terms of population on the continent need to have positions of decision making. They need to sit at these tables with no delay. And this is the intergenerational inequity uh, Elizabeth was talking about, that young people need to be at tables where the future is being discussed and shaped. So, so, so that is really where I am as, as a member of parliament, as, an, as a policymaker at this point in time. But I do want to say in terms of uh, then finding a way to, one, have not only champions who understand that more young people need to have a, a place decision making tables, but actually rally behind young people's participation in these areas. Um, for example, during the pandemic, we saw that you know this global health crisis saw us quickly transitioning to technology and its benefits. Um, one in our in our country, for example, in Namibia, we made sure that the government-run uh, telecommunications companies reduced data. Uh, costs for both students and those that are, are going to transition to working from home. And that, of course, increased traffic and that we saw fault lines in terms of the capacity our telecommunications infrastructure can hold in a country of just 2.5 million. So we have, with the lessons learned over a period of only 12 months, embarked on upgrading our infrastructure so that be able to give quality uh, network connection to our, our citizens, but also more affordable and accessible to every person, including young people who are finding more innovative ways on how to make an income on online spaces because traditional jobs, unfortunately, cannot absorb everybody. Then the second one will be access to information. We have recently um, uh, tabled in parliament and access to information law. I think sometimes we take it for granted that without information, you can't access opportunities. And majority of the young people on this continent, sometimes the only difference be between them and getting a bursary or scholarship for education, getting a grant for a business venture they've started is actually the information on where to get that assistance, where to, to, to take the application form once filled, and the steps they need to take to actually get that benefit. So, so that is something we realize that as more people get onto online spaces, we need to make it easier for them to access information and young people particularly would benefit from that. So we have that law in parliament that is currently being discussed. So we have an opportunity for young people to, to, to have access to information. But I want to digress a little bit, a little bit to say that in terms of the SDGs, we need to have major shifts. 
And these major shifts need to lie ahead of us. I mean, if we're talking about you know, leaders in government, the private sector, um, even civil society organizations reimagining and redesigning jobs, our financing mod models, our mobility, our healthcare, our education, and so on. The new understanding is that we need uh, to allow emerging technologies to not only guide us in the opportunities that lie ahead, but also to decide that as young people and old people, we need to have collaborative efforts in the way we take decisions that impact young people. It needs to be all systems that need to be guided by both generations. Otherwise, we will have a 60% of the population on this continent continuously lagging behind, continuously being frustrated and not being put uh, on the table, decision-making tables for them to, to take decisions. I often say that young people that are angry and that are frustrated are an unguided missile. And as a continent, similar to what uh, uh, my brother from Cameroon said now, um, peace, you cannot build when there's no peace. And we if we had young people who are unguided missiles on this continent and were threatening um, through their frustration, the, the systems we've put in place to only benefit a few, we are unable to move the needle. So we need more young people in decision-making processes. Emma Tiafeles as young, one young person in, in the parliament and as one young person in executive executive uh, committee of, of members of, of cabinet ministers and deputy ministers is not enough. We need more Emmas on the continent to move the needle. Otherwise, my voice will continue to, continue to be drowned in the voices of those who have been in the system for longer. Thank you, Claude. Well, thank you for that. And I want to stay on this topic um, of youth and, and inclusion. And I want to go also uh, into the topic of technology. And what you said about generating more income through access to information is really important because we're living in the information industry and, 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 and a lot of the frustration, the pent up frustration that I would call it, that is building on the African continent is a lot of young Africans are now finding ways to educate themselves with online tools, yet they found themselves unable to secure a job or generate income, as you said. So in your um, strategies, for providing more tools for information for the youth, how do you create a mechanism where this education can actually lead to either employment or entrepreneurship and just kind of income generation? A very good question. So, so can I, maybe before, before uh, Emma, before you come in, I just wanted to say thank you all so much. Uh, I've been listening with a lot of enthusiasm. I think we will take many of your points forward. We need more Emmas, we need more clothes, we need many, many more of many of you are on the panel today. And I hope that we can continue with the Economic Commission for Africa to work together to see how we can include you in many more of our activities as we have done today and to see how you can tell us what we can do more, better and differently. Uh, actually, Kay, um, I hope that we can continue education. Education is key. Hopefully that we can follow up on a few things, um, see how maybe with your experience in, in working on conflict and conflict affected areas, we can take those stories uh, further afield and help others uh, that are also in the same situation. But once again, thank you so much. And I look forward to continuing this conversation with you. In the meantime, have a happy uh, holidays, happy new year, happy Christmas, uh, wear your mask and be safe. And hopefully that uh, we can talk very early in the new year. Thank you again so much. Thank you. Thank you, Vera. Thank you so much, Dr. Sangwe, for this opportunity. So Emma, I'm, I'm education for employment and education for entrepreneurship and education for income generation. Yes. So I think the first one, um, I would say in terms of access to information, I want to um, uh, just go back to a project I recently concluded, which is called Bring Up a Body to Poly. So it's an initiative to bring young people closer to parliament and closer to democratic processes. Uh, so that's one way I've managed to create a network of young people I can actually have connection to, to assist them in any ventures they have. And so far, you have young people who just need uh, somebody to facilitate an email between them, um, their venture, and a, a potential funder of their innovative idea, or young person um, uh, to connect them and to a potential bank that uh, can give them a grant in, 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 in actually accessing the financing they need to run their program or project. So that has been one. But secondly, I think so far we have 
put systems in place that we have created um, in our education system where if you have been working in a field for quite a long time, we have what we call mature age entry. So once you have, you do not necessarily have the necessary qualifications, or even if you do, you have had more experience than you had education um, that you managed to, to achieve uh, during your time of work. So based on that, you're able to gain employment based of the experience you've had in a particular industry. And if you'd like your education to then be bumped up uh, through the, the, the skills you already have, through my mature age entry, you're also able to get um, access to uh, particular courses for a shorter period of time. Because you already have been in the field uh, learning, you now have the opportunity to get the education needed for you to, 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 to get your skills uh, bumped up to the level you need to actually grow your career. So those are some of the initiatives. But I think there is still some structural, st structural challenges in terms of uh, certain to find certain courses um, that one gains on, on the internet, for example. So we have a qualifications authority that we're constantly engaging, for example, so that when people harness uh, the opportunities on the internet and actually get educated or, 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 or run businesses on, on the internet uh, through e-commerce, um, we have an opportunity for them through the skills they are gaining to actually translate them to get some type of recognition based off the qualifications they've gained gained on online um, universities, online courses. And, and although it's quite slow, I think with COVID-19, we saw that more and more institutions, whether private or government, are leaning more towards accepting the, the digital transformation that comes with education, that comes with trade. And, 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 and that is really uh, an ongoing process, but I'm very uh, optimistic that as more and more young people harness that what technology has to offer to go beyond um, the brick and mortar of, of how we used to look at how businesses are run, um, using Facebook as basically the only place where one can connect to their customers. I think more and more people re will, will appreciate and realize that the internet of things, um, you know, that the ability for technology to transform our industries is eminent and our education should also not be left behind because of, of reluctancy of actually accepting that the digital transformation is here and we do not want to be left behind as a continent. Thank you, Emma. I wanna stay on the topic of digital transformation and I wanna do it by moving from Southern Africa to West Africa where I'm from. Mm -hmm. And that's when I, I, I can transition to Professor Aji Busodiang. You, um, you know, you're very modest, but a lot of people know that you were the first black female faculty member in Princeton School of Engineering. And this is uh, in more than a uh, hundred years. And, and I think this is really inspiring because every time I go to Senegal and, 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 and meet young people there, I find that so many of them are geniuses in the world of STEM, right? They're so strong with mathematics. They're so strong in understanding physics, yet they haven't had the kind of formal educational support that Western uh, nations often provide to their young um, students. And so the fact that you are able to rise through the ranks and, and achieve something so momentous is, is really great. And what I find really, um, really encouraging about your own trajectory is you didn't just choose to be, you know, living in Princeton, the Ivory Tower, I, Ivy League, um, um, you, you know, kind of comfort, you are very much giving back with the Africa I Know project. And I, I think it'd be great if you could tell us about what you're hoping to achieve with the Africa I Know and, and, and how your upbringing in, in, in Senegal could lead you to such a path of high, high, high level academic success and how you can help to uh, bring other young Africans along with you uh, with some of the strategies that you're using with the Africa I Know. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claude, for your, for your kind words. Um, my, my trajectory from Senegal is what motivates me. Uh, it's what motivated me to start the Africa I Know. And a lot of the projects we're doing is inspired by looking back at, uh, you know, when I was growing up, what, what was missing, because I feel like I've been very lucky and a lot of people aren't endowed with that luck. And so I've been trying to make sense of, um, the things that I did right and trying to reflect that in the projects we are conducting at the Africa I Know. I think what, what, um, what's missing right now on the continent is 
investment in STEM education, and that is the main focus of the Africa I know. The reason why I strongly believe in STEM, which technology is only one part of, there's, there's the science part, scientific discovery, there's the engineering part, there's the uh, mathematical mathematics part, and of course technology, but we shouldn't forget the other, um, the other uh, letters. The reason why do remind, you mind reminding everybody what STEM um, stands for, because I, I find that a lot of young people don't know what STEM actually stands for. Yes, it's science, technology, engineering and mathematics. And of course, all the related subjects uh, also fall under that one acronym, for example, economics, artificial intelligence and machine learning, all of those are considered STEM subjects. The reason why I think it's critical that our governments invest in STEM education from the primary up to the tertiary is because I think it's key to solving many of the problems we're currently facing. One main problem we're facing is that, you know, in the continent, we are blessed with all these resources, all these raw materials that get discovered every day. Uh, we found uh, gas in Senegal not a while ago. Um, what's happening is that we don't have the talent, um, the, 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 the talent in place to transform those materials and export it to the, to the global global world, what's happening is that because we don't have talent in place, the Western world comes, um, buys our materials at a very cheap uh, price, and they go and transform it and come and sell us the products at an even higher price. So that's not sustainable if we want to uh, enjoy economic growth. And so I think there's a need for, you know, empowering the youth, building capacity, giving them the skills they need to be able to act as builders and not as, as uh, consumers, that's one. And there are many things that are illustrative of that problem of lack of investment in, in STEM education. Um, we are not capable of building our own infrastructure. Um, my brother is, has a business selling fabric, that's what his job is. And what he has to do is that he has to go outside the country, he has to go to China, buy the fabric and comes and sells it again in Senegal when there's a huge demand um, in Senegal, Mali, and, and, and bordering uh, countries. So there's no infrastructure in place for us to build our own fabric when we have the actual resources to do the, the actual material to do that. That's one example. Another illustrative example for how we are not investing enough in STEM education early on is that the current pandemic, we haven't been able to produce our own vaccines. We are relying on the generosity of the West to allow us to vaccinate our people and, and, and survive this pandemic. And there are many other uh, examples illustrating why we are not currently investing in empowering the youth and building capacity and empowering them, giving them the skills they need to build for the continent. So the, the, what, what, what the vision is for the Africa I know is that um, we want to empower the youth. We want to give them confidence that they can build for the continent. We want to give them the skills they need the information they need to um, be their own enablers, to build their own, uh, their own tools, their own projects, their own vision for the continent. And I think one way to do that is making education, STEM education accessible freely at no charge, sharing insights when it comes to the different fields of study that are there in STEM. You know, there, there, there are many things. There's physics and it's br several branches. There's uh, engineering and it's several branches. There's computer science and it's uh, several branches. Um, there's artificial intelligence, which offers a huge, huge opportunity for the continent to four key sectors like manufacturing, healthcare, even the climate crisis right now. And so the vision is to, 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 to set that in place so that the youth has the skill they need to build for the continent. Let's say the first question, and ask you um, about a key word that's been coming up in this topic uh, that we're exploring today and hopefully finding solutions for, which is affordability and the word free. So yes. um, how, how can we do this? I mean, what I'm doing with True Africa University is creating an online platform so that people can access the courses from their home but the issue yeah. of data often comes up because the video part is becoming so expensive. A lot of people just tune into these sessions without putting on the video, which means that they get a lesser experience. With things that are yes. as sophisticated as what you are focusing on in STEM and machine learning, artificial intelligence, how can we make this accessible and in some 
there's accessibility in terms of you know digital accessibility meaning you know access to electricity which is very basic uh, and access to the internet but there's also accessibility in terms of language barriers in stem the majority of resources available online are in english and we know that not everyone on the continent speaks english we have our local languages we have other western languages like french and portuguese and so at the Africa, I know one thing that, that, that we also uh, see is important is that access in terms of uh, ling linguistic access. And so we're doing a lot of translation. And I think that's key to making sure that, you know, all this digital content, all this educational content available online already, there's a lot of content already. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. Um, just making that available in, in our languages, in languages of the continent goes a long way. And um, I think what you're doing is important with the, um, the, the, the African, the, the true Africa university, because, you know, a lot of people on the continent, young people have been using mobile devices. There's a lot of, there's a, there's a huge penetration when it comes to mobile devices on the continent compared to even, you know, Western countries. So that's very encouraging. And that's an opportunity that we should leverage to actually um, power education through that. And so um, I think, I think these initiatives, uh, EduTech, uh, digital education, uh, are, are the things that we need to be investing in more, but not forgetting that there's financial access. So um, people may not even have the price to buy a computer or mobile devices. So that's up to you know governments to empower us on that front a little bit more. And R Rwanda has actually started an initiative distributing mobile devices to its citizens, which I think is just awesome and needs to be replicated. Um, and um, there's access when it comes to um, internet electricity access, which also is, you know, up to our governments to, 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 to do. Uh, many other countries outside the continent have solved that problem of, of access to electricity and internet. So we, we should focus on that. There's also access, like I said, linguistic access, which is not being looked up, looked, um, which, which is not being discussed and which is a huge problem. There's a huge language barrier across the continent. We all speak different languages. Um, and there are people in, in remote areas, uh, in, in, in villages who don't speak the languages of the West. And so we need to figure out how to have these educational resources accessible to them. Yeah. Well, that's, that's really wonderful because you're talking about using tools and making them accessible and, and finding ways to create new opportunities with these tools and the accessibility. And with that, I want to move back to Southern Africa and, 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 and really ask a question to, to Tobo Katola around the work that he's been doing with Lion Tutoring, which, which is now serving thousands of young Africans. So in your assessment of this change force that has emerged from this talk, which is really education and, and digital tools for education that can lead to employment, um, what are you seeing as the the skills that are really needed at this moment to confront the challenges of the 21st century, specifically in a world where COVID has decimated some of the middle classes in our African countries and young people are sometimes feeling like the odds are stacked against them uh, all over the continent. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Grunitsky, once again. And um, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's good that I spoke before um, Honorable Theophilus and Dr. Dieng, because there's a lot of things that they spoke about that really resonate with me, especially when you talk about um, collaboration, when you talk about, um, you know, the, 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 in, the internet of things, when you talk about the fourth industrial revolution. So really the COVID um, has really exposed, you know, um, the way that we do things, particularly I'll just speak of education. You know, some of the skills that um, really um, we're training for are skills that are sort of redundant because we've seen through the COVID people are starting to work from home, the fourth industrial revolution. So imagine if somebody is, um, is, is you know, is doing things the, 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 the conservative way or selling things the conservative way. They were obviously affected by the lockdowns, et cetera. So I like what you're saying that, you know, we really need to look out into our education systems, you know, what are we really building for, um, uh, especially now that COVID has, you know, 
affected most of these industries. But I'd like to particularly, you know, talk about collaboration as one of the changing forces um, that Claude has talked about. You know, collaboration is something that even in Africa, we don't really get to collaborate. It's only when I went to Senegal um, that I saw that they have some of the nicest mangoes. And in Botswana, most of the mangoes that we have, you see that they're coming from Spain or coming from Greece. You know, once they package it, they'll say packaged in Greece or Spain. But Senegal has nice mangoes. So which sort of brings me to the, you know, African free trade area, you know. I think um, that is something that we really need to get into because um, if it's in full effect, you know, you're looking at a population of 1.2 billion and 3.4 uh, trillion GDP that, you know, if we can trade amongst ourselves as Africans, we don't really need to look to the West, you know. Um, I can even see on our screen talking about vaccines, you know, that, that our country, for instance, had vaccination um, for cattle, and we had some of the best vaccines for cattle. And, you know, the, the infrastructure is there, the technology is there. I know it's not the same, but, you know, that's something that we could start, you know, working on to sort of have a vaccine um, in our continent. So really collaboration is something that we need to, you know, look into how do you do business with other parts of Africa, other parts of the continent. And in terms of youth, uh, at Lion Tutoring, we sort of looked at the value chain of education, um, just, you know, responding to what uh, Claude has asked. Um, and we looked at in the value chain of education, you know, some people are providing uniforms, some people are providing stationery, you know, even digital um, sort of, you know, marketing. So at Lion Tutoring, we normally prefer to work with other young people and we're unapologetic about it, you know. Um, we, we always look to young businesses first before we can get to do business with, you know, already established, you know, big companies or giants in what we're doing. So, um, yeah, we, we always prefer to do business with young people just to empower them. Of course, sometimes the quality might not be as good, but, you know, who started off with, you know, really good quality in what they're doing? You know, it's just through the support of other businesses that we are where we are today. So I think collaboration is something um, we need to really look at. I really resonate with what Honorable Theophilus talked about in terms of, you know, data. You know, countries that are most innovative in using technology, we can see that their data costs have been reduced, you know. Um, and, you know, in, in the context of, of Botswana, we still can get one gigabyte of data for something like $0.1, which is quite expensive uh, from countries like Kenya, countries like um, uh, 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 Rwanda, where the data costs have been taken really low. And that is sort of a leverage to help, you know, um, young businesses to be able to innovate, to be able to play in the digital space. So, yeah, if there's something you can pick for me, it's just collaboration. We try to collaborate as much um, in the context of Botswana, but even in the context of Southern Africa. Uh, one of the biggest schools that came into Botswana a few months ago, um, it's actually based in South Africa, Nigeria, and Kenya. They wanted access to our market, to our database. So with the consent of our customers, we provided it to them in exchange for their database in, in, in Senton. That's how we were able to penetrate into the South African market. Of course, with the Poppy Act, you know, Personal Protection Act and all of that, we're able to go around it. But, you know, collaboration is something that is really big and dear to my heart. My change force. Yeah, though that's a great change for us because we can't do anything if, if, we're, if we're divided. And I'm very, very happy, Tobo, that you mentioned the African continental free trade area. I was hoping somebody would mention it and I thought you might. And I think it's really interesting that we're talking about it because again, just like the sustainable development goals um, and STEM, a lot of young Africans that I, that I teach or that I work with are not familiar with these very important uh, movements or agreements uh, that are being um, actually, um, uh, well, put in place so that they can help to change the destiny of the continent. Even if we look at the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa that is hosting this uh, uh, online summit today, um, the estimate from UNECA is that the agreement, the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, 
will boost intra-African trade by 52% by 2022, by, by next year. So that's a very ambitious target, and that's an ambitious and generous estimate. However, it can do it, and it can happen, and we can do it together. And with that, I want to perhaps turn it back to our honorable Emma Theophilus, Deputy Minister of ICT for the Republic of Namibia, to perhaps kind of wrap it up for us uh, in terms of looking at this, uh, this incredible change force that is emerging in the world of education, that is emerging in the world of government intervention, infrastructure, um, affordability, building our own tools for the continent, collaboration needed. A lot of the things that we're seeing on this beautiful art that is being provided to us. If you could wrap it up for us before we transition uh, to our final speaker, I think we would all be extremely, extremely grateful. Thank you so much, Claude. Um, incredible insights by, by Dr. Dieng, by uh, my brother Topo from uh, Botswana. The truth of the matter is one, um, as a continent, uh, the investment in young people will realize um, our ability to achieve the sustainable development goals on the continent. An investment in education, investment in the ability to access the internet, investment in job creation so that young people are able to make their income, run their ventures um, without dependency on, on states or, or other actors that do not have their best interest in heart, uh, at heart, uh, the ability to collaborate, especially where decision-making is concerned, the future of our continent, having more young people at uh, uh, tables of decision-making so they're able to guide those are currently uh, you know, majority uh, in spaces of decision making on what the future looks like for young people, because the future belongs to us. Um, but also um, in terms of truly invest matters. I mean, you look at our health, um, education, our technology, our financing, our redefining of jobs, um, whether it's from vaccines, whether it's to e-commerce, whether it's mobility, how our transportation systems work, um, all of those need an investment in terms of where the money should go uh, so that we're able to de develop the capacity to industrialize our economy. So that is the only way we're able to have an active uh, majority of our communities and societies if they're able to be absorbed by, by the the the, the industries that we need to build as a continent. Uh, when I was in the student union, uh, we used to say a lot um, that when it comes to the investment of education, the fish should pay, the diamonds should pay, the gold should pay, the silver. They're basically saying is that our natural resources, our raw natural resources should be the ones to develop our countries and to industrialize our economies. That is the only way we can fully um, uh, eliminate many of the challenges we have on this continent and move towards actually achieving our goals, not only the sustainable development goals, but actually achieving um, the agenda 2063 we have set for us as a continent. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. It, this has been just truly wonderful. I really, really have appreciated the, um, the candor, the optimism, but ultimately we can't just be uh, cheerleaders. We can't just be Africans expecting white people to come and save us in Africa. What I'm hearing is we're taking the destiny in our own hands, the destiny of Africa in our own hands, and we're going to be empowering Africans um, so that it, we can't just be uh, expectations of handouts coming from foreign nations that have actually no real uh, vested interest in the success of Africa. So this is giving me a lot of hope. And I wanna really wrap it up today by welcoming uh, in a pre-recorded speech, our final um, speaker with the closing remarks today. And that person is Ms. Jayatma Wiekra Mayinayate, who was a UN Secretary General's, uh, Secretary General's envoy for, for, on, on youth. Excellencies, fellow young people, friends, greetings from Sri Lanka. Thank you very much to the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa for inviting me to join all of you for this conversation on Africa's youth in the decade of action. It is truly a pleasure to address such a diverse group of young leaders from all over the African continent for this very important event today. 
As the United Nations Secretary General's Envoy on Youth, a core part of my mandate is to bring the United Nations closer to young people and bring young people closer to the United Nations. The greatest tool that I have to do this work is Youth 2030, the United Nations' first ever system-wide youth strategy. This strategy envisions a world in which the human rights of every young person are realized, a world that ensures every young person is empowered to achieve their full potential, and a world that recognizes young people's agency, resilience, and positive contributions as agents of change. We have seen some significant progress on these fronts over the recent years, including here in Africa, but we still have a long way to go to ensure better youth representation and participation across the board in our work. We need to put an increasing emphasis on elevating the voices of those young people who are often left farthest behind, including young women and girls, young persons living with disabilities, young LGBTIQ plus people, indigenous youth, and young refugees and migrants. In many ways, we are at an inflection point in history. The COVID-19 pandemic has served as a wake-up call, and with the climate crisis looming, the world is experiencing its biggest shared test since the Second World War. Yet, even in these difficult circumstances, young people like yourselves have always been stepping up to the challenge. Here in Africa, I have been inspired to have the opportunity to engage with many young people who are taking leadership in finding solutions and advocating for positive transformational change. It is young leaders like you who will play a critical role in challenging the status quo, building peace in your communities, and setting our world on a track for a better and a more sustainable future. Our world desperately needs your energy and your imagination. It needs leadership that is driven by compassion, solidarity, and unity. A clear roadmap we have to support in these efforts is called Our Common Agenda, the UN Secretary General's latest agenda of action which presents concrete proposals for how we can all work together and create a future that is better for everyone. This report covers a wide range of recommendations from how we can combat misinformation to how we can better foster global solidarity to how we can accelerate meaningful action against climate change. And at the core of all these efforts, the report calls for deepening solidarity with the world's young people and future generations. For so long, we have known that those who inherit the consequences of the decisions we take today are barely represented in decision making, which is heavily weighted towards the short term. This is a chance to change that paradigm. The world today is home to the largest generation of youth in history, making it clear that young people represent the greatest opportunity and the greatest asset we have to achieve their sustainable development goals. This is especially true across Africa, where the continent's population is the world's youngest with the median age of just 19.7 years. I have no doubt that it will be Africa's youth who will steer the continent's trajectory in the 21st century. The world already has the knowledge and the resources to achieve the goals that we have. Young people have the energy, ingenuity, ambition, and the skills and the expertise to make them a reality. That is why I'm calling on all policymakers everywhere to urgently make greater investments in Africa's youth, from quality education to universal health care to skills development and creating decent jobs. Building the capacities of young people and ensuring that they have the opportunities to achieve their full potential will be critical to delivering Agenda 2030 and Agenda 2063. There's no better investment we can make than in the capacities and potential of our young people. At the same time, I encourage young people across Africa to continue what you're doing, to continue actively holding your governments accountable and raising these issues through advocacy. From its inception, the United Nations was envisioned to unite stakeholders against the world's greatest challenges. 
So as we look to recover better from COVID-19, now more than ever, we need all stakeholders to join efforts in steering our world into a more peaceful, equitable and inclusive path. I look forward to continue to work hand in hand with you all to ensure that the United Nations is ready and is able to deliver together with and for young people everywhere because achieving the sustainable development goals by 2030 depends on it. Thank you. I want to thank the United Nations Secretary General's Envoy on Youth, Ms. Yayatma Wikramarnayake for these words that really are driven by the United Nations agenda. And I think that it's very important for all of us to start showing the trends of things that are actually working across Africa. I think it's really important to build new engagement platforms to drive young people to be interested in some of the topics that we've been discussing today. It's been an absolute pleasure. And again, a real honor for me to moderate this conference uh, today. I've been calling it a conference. I've been calling it um, a summit. Whatever it was, it was a way for us to collaborate and start thinking of real pathways so that young Africans can become real actors and not just bystanders in this uh, revolution that is coming mostly through technology and that will be affecting every sector of um, future growth in Africa. I want to thank my panelists on this topic who really didn't mince words. I think that they spoke openly about their own experiences, which are grounded in realities, local realities, but that can also uh, be um, driven by Pan-African approaches to collaboration. Those panelists are Emma Teofilis, Deputy Minister of Information um, Communications and Technology of the Republic of Namibia, Professor Aji Buso Diang, the founder of The Africa I Know and an assistant professor at Princeton University, Mr. Tobo Katola, the Managing Director of Lion Tutoring, Mr. Achaleke Christian Leke, the Executive Director of Loyok in Cameroon. And I also wanna thank the team that organized this conference slash summit. And again, welcoming us today was Dr. Vera Songwe, the Under Secretary General of the United Nations, who was also the Executive Secretary of the Economic Commission for Africa. Thank you. It's been an absolute delight. And I look forward to seeing many of you soon and even some of you in real life. Take care. Thanks a lot.